Yeah, I think YouTube's not working, so just give me be patient with me for a few minutes, guys. All right, sound looks like we're we're good on Twitch sound wise too. All right, there we go. I think YouTube's up and running now. So we'll give a few minutes for everybody to get in. Oh, I better go get a plug. I hate when that happens. The sun just came out here in Ohio, so <laughs> I've got to go close some curtains here. All right, if you're there on YouTube, let me know by saying hello. Just want to make sure everything's running properly. It took a little bit of time for me to get YouTube going. Hey, looks like YouTube must be working. Can you hear me okay? Randall's Fortnite videos. Sounds like something my son would be into. Oh, I am so glad to be back to doing streams again. It has been entirely too long. I've missed being able to chat with everybody. So I'm going to give till maybe about five after, and then I'll probably start diving into this. Uh, I know it's a weird time for some folks, and there were some folks who said they were going to join in, but were coming home from work or other things like that. So, And some folks here in the States are probably watching some uh, NFL football. Or American football, as the rest of you would call it. Not to be confused with real football. So I'm going to be doing uh, Gettysburg on my current campaign of Ultimate General Civil War, which is the No Infantry Campaign Challenge. And it's going to go really, really well for this one. Because the uh, the numbers are just insane in my favor. Uh, it looks like I forgot to... Take care of the 7th Cavalry. While we're waiting, I have a couple of kind of housekeeping issues i got to take care of here. Um, i got to sell off some of these infantry weapons that are sitting in my armory that I've captured. Make a nice amount of money from some of these. Nice, that helps a lot with my financial situation. And then we need to buy up whatever we can. so that hopefully those things will replenish. All right, we got a bunch of skirmisher weapons we can snatch up to. Now, I want to be careful because I want to leave a little bit of money because I'm going to need some supplies as the battle goes along. Since this is a three-day battle, those supplies are going to replenish throughout the, throughout the campaign here and throughout the battle. I'm going to sell off some of these field pieces that I am never going to use. Alright, there we go. War of Rights. Yes, I have. Uh, actually, I know I've got a ton of videos on my channel, but I actually have played some War of Rights on there. Uh, I bought into that like a year ago. Uh, so I've played it quite a bit. I'm going to revisit that probably this week sometime now that it's on early release. So there's a lot more people because what was happening is there were so few of us who had the game uh, early on that it was really hard to get into a big battle. Even when I could, it would only be maybe 20 or 30 people playing at a time. And the nature of that game requires there to be a lot more people. Uh, so now that there are, I, I got into one the other day and there were like 150 people playing. So uh, I definitely want to dive back into that. So that'll be happening sometime this week. In fact, for a while I was an officer in one of the companies, but I just wasn't playing enough uh, to really justify being given that role. All right. Um, we got a lot of these 10 pounders, but I think I'm going to hold off on that right now. Uh, let's go ahead and see what cavalry weapons I can 
gobble up here. Sweet. Yeah, it's really cool. It's uh, something I'm looking forward to uh, seeing where they go with that. Man, I don't know if I want to buy up any more of these. I won't have much money left. I'm going to sell some of these 10-pounders. I just don't think I'm going to use that many of those ever. Same with the 12-pound Napoleons. We'll just sell some of those for now so I can snatch up the rest of these cavalry weapons. Okay. So yeah, I mean, if I if I get enough time now that my schedule has slowed way down, um, maybe I can jump back into being an officer in one of those units. All right, let's dive into Gettysburg here. So uh, you'll see what I mean about the. Uh, it's going to be a bloodbath. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna just completely destroy the Confederate army in this battle. Uh, it's going to be glorious. I'm gonna put the the second corps with tomorrow's reinforcements, and then the third corps here. Um, all right, so this was what it looks like going in. Do I think they'll eventually have it on Xbox? I don't see why they couldn't. I mean, the nature of that game, there's there's not a lot of controls involved. So um, I would certainly think that if they can do games like Call of Duty on Xbox, there's no reason they couldn't do War of Rights. I guess it really just depends on their resources and whether or not they can port it over easily if they have the ability to do that. And if it's successful on the PC, I, I, I would imagine they ought to be able to do that. Okay, so um, we're going to get started here in just a second. I uh, just wanted to, I'm double checking to make sure all the streams are still going. Looks like they are. So we're good to go. So yeah, 39,741 men on day one at Gettysburg with 353 guns and I'm on the defense. So uh, this is going to just be a mess for the Confederate Army. Uh, of course, the catch is the way the reinforcements happen for the Union, even though I've got way more men than him. I'm not necessarily going to have all of them at the beginning, especially here at the very beginning where it's not even troops from my army. These are the, uh, the units that belong to uh, General Buford, who was the, uh, the cavalry commander for the Union here. So really, I'm just going to sacrifice these guys and, and let them just kind of take it uh, here at the beginning to buy time for my army to get up. Now... A definite advantage I'm going to have th with this being that most of my units are mounted is that I'm going to be able to get my troops into position on Seminary Ridge much, much faster than I would if they were traditional uh, infantry units. So let's go ahead and just get these guys given hold orders so they can sit tight and just buy time, slow down uh, Heath's division as best they can. So I've, I've talked a lot about this battle in other videos that I've done, but I also recognize that a lot of folks are new to the channel and may not have seen some of these. So we'll talk a little bit about the history as we go along. The history of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's a, a battlefield that uh, if you ever have the opportunity, I highly recommend. Um, as far as Civil War battlefields go in the United States, there's nothing really that compares with Gettysburg. Uh, in terms of what's available to you to learn about the battle, there's far more monuments, far more history to be explored it's also the most commercial of all the battlefields uh you go down you know down the road an hour an hour and a half or so down to antietam it's completely different uh even the crowds i mean there's very little crowds at antietam so i would recommend both of those in the east haven't gotten a ch chance to visit as many battlefields in the west so we'll just keep gamble right here but i'm going to go ahead and uh, dismount the eighth illinois all right, history boy. Hey, take care. Have a great day. Uh, this will be live later. I mean, so you can come back and watch it later. Obviously, just can't interact, but the video itself will certainly be live on the channel later on once the live stream concludes. So just buying time here. Come on, third, third Indiana, you need to hang tight. I believe the very first Confederate soldier to die in this battle was in Archer's 7th Tennessee. Of course, people don't realize just how insane 
the battle was on the first day at Gettysburg. I think the third day, the second, and even especially the third day, but also the second, get a lot of the glory. But, uh, man, I mean, the fighting, especially on the Union side, but on both sides, it was done on the first day. And the, and the massive amounts of casualties suffered by some of these units on the first day of the battle, um, you just can't even wrap, wrap your mind around it. I mean, the first corps for the Union suffered well over 50% casualties as a corps and still stood their ground. And the only reason they eventually had to withdraw is because their their right flank up here got turned when the 11th Corps fell back, or else they would have probably held. So we're just buying time here. In two minutes, I'm going to start getting my reinforcements. We're going to rush them up onto Seminary Ridge and hold our position there, and then we're just going to inflict crazy amounts of casualties on the Confederate Army. All right, so our first reinforcements arrive. So we're gonna pause here because I, I wanna make sure that I can kinda handle this as they come in. There's General Grant at Gettysburg. So again, not, not the least bit concerned about these troops. Uh, I'm gonna just let them hold until they get wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, if this was a real battle, obviously I wouldn't do that to my men, but these are just a bunch of sprites on a map. So here we go. So these are all mounted infantry units. We're going to rush them up into position and then dismount them and get them into those fortifications. I want to get these smoothbore guns up here as well. So the nice thing is I've got so many units. Okay, the 3rd West Virginia just fell back. Got so many units that it gives me a little freedom to get on some flanks here. Oh, hey, look at that. Maybe not. Still, they're buying plenty of time for me to get into position. Let's get these guys dismounted and into position. All right, we're going to drop Devin in up here now. Devin's third West Virginia. The key on this battle is just getting in position on Seminary Ridge before... Heath's division is able to push forward there. So by delaying, I've easily been able to do that. Once you take these positions, it's relatively easy to win the first day's fight. But playing as the Union uh, on Gettysburg, you have to fight the whole battle. Whereas if you fight as the Confederates, if you're able to advance all the way to Cemetery Hill on day one, you can win the battle. So we're going to go ahead and slow these guys down as much as possible. And I'm just going to... Normally, if this was my army, I would probably at this point drop back to the stronger position here. But since it's not my army, I'm just going to let these guys hold and inflict as many casualties as they can. Make my job easier up here. Gives me time to get the guns into position. Alright, looks like these guys are starting to fall back here. Let's see if we can... We, we might be able to get Caliph's battery out before they get hit. Especially if I move Gamble back up here. Gamble's 8th New York. Alright, let's pull Devin out. We'll go ahead and get these guys over here and just put them up on the flank.
Hopefully I get some more artillery soon. Let's go ahead and drop Buford back now, too. These guys are still holding. I'm really impressed by that. All right, we're going to drop them back. Try to use these guys to maybe get up on the flank when he when he pulls in here. I'm going to keep Devin up here on the flank. Devin's 9th New York. So numbers are fairly even now. Actually, I have a, an advantage on the battlefield, and I'm going to be getting more reinforcements before long. Actually, I think I'm going to pull these guys right down to here. Yeah, you can have McPherson Ridge. Forward 1862, you are absolutely right. Taking Washington on Legendary was a nightmare. If you watched my my whole Legendary campaign, you saw I actually had to go back a couple of different times and replay several battles because the first time I got to Washington, there was no chance whatsoever I was going to be able to take it. Uh, so I had to go back and refight the last several battles before Washington to give myself any kind of chance to be able to win. And then I barely, barely won Washington. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've, I've put a lot of hours into this game, and I still don't claim to be any kind of an expert. I, uh, I'm not a good. I'm not good with details. Uh, I'm a big picture guy, so like grand strategy usually does well for me. But managing troops on the battlefield, I tend to lose track of some of my men. I don't always look at my mini map as often as I should, and occasionally I'll just lose sight of things. So, one of the best things about having this channel is. It's made me a better player by making these videos because it it invites hundreds, if not thousands, of other p pairs of eyes to observe what I'm doing and to say and to you know just make constructive criticism about things that they see. And I've never taken that in a negative way. I've always welcomed that criticism because it makes me a better player uh, as I learn from other people and as they share things that they observe that I do well or don't do well. Oh boy. Okay, so Frank just got driven out. This is the problem sometimes with occupying fortifications. So we need to rush these guys over here to plug this gap. I need to get more of my reinforcements. They'll be coming here in a couple minutes. Let's go ahead and send some more help around here too. All right, Burnside just got driven out too. So this is a little bit of a problem. So we're going to get more reinforcements now. Um, this is the way this battle went. I mean, it, it started with Cutler's uh, brigade being the first one to get in here over on this side of the railroad cut. Um, the elements of the 1st Corps, the 1st Division, um, the Iron Brigade, obviously, they filled in over here on this side of the railroad cut. Uh, and as units came onto the field, they just were rushed right into the battle. And that was actually where General um, General Reynolds was killed, the uh, First Corps. Actually, he was not just the First Corps commander of the Union Army at that point. He was he was commander of the entire wing, so he was actually in command of several corps. He was the second in command of the Union Army. Uh, and so he got killed as he was rushing the Iron Brigade, one of the Wisconsin um, regiments, into position. So here comes a bunch of help that I desperately need. Thankfully, it's mounted. I need to get these 20-pounders up. We'll get them up on this side. I gotta, I'm going to send basically all of these guys to the right side. I'm going to hold back the 40th Kentucky as kind of a reserve here. Because most of the attack's coming on my right. And we've already got ammo issues. Oh, Chris, yeah. Have you been to Gettysburg before? Absolutely love visiting there. I've probably, it's nice. I, I have a, you know, an advantage for me is that I'm only about four hours away from Gettysburg where I live. So uh, anytime I'm in that area or if I'm going to Philadelphia or to Washington, D.C. or something, I always try to swing by even if it's only for a few hours. The new visitor center they have, have there is just absolutely outstanding.
So forward, you uh, you mentioned the Reynolds versus Lee question. What specifically are you referring to? Just as far as like their skills as commanders, I think it would have been interesting to see how Reynolds might have done. I think Reynolds probably would have been given command of the Union Army, but I think if I remember right, he turned it down, and then it was uh, basically told to Meade that he was taking command. He wasn't given the the choice. That's right, Chris. I think I did know that, that you lived in this area. All right, so we're solid here. We've got multiple lines now. He's not even trying to hit me on this side. I'm going to move these 24-pounders over here. My supplies still haven't arrived. Honestly, I could make life pretty miserable for him right now and just move up and try to take McPherson Ridge back. So historically, uh, you know, I always love to look at historical events through the eyes of my own family members who were there. Uh, and I had several an direct ancestors or, or brothers of ancestors. It would be uncles um, who were at Gettysburg. Uh, my third great grandfather was in the 56 Pennsylvania Company I. Uh, and they actually fired the, they were the very first Union infantry troops to fire a, a shot at Gettysburg. They came in over here on this side of the railroad cut. They were in Cutler's Brigade. Uh, had a, an uncle named Andrew Jackson McGuire who was with the 26th North Carolina, the, uh, the unit that suffered the he heaviest casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he was killed on July 1st, facing off against the, the Iron Brigade, the 24th Michigan. Uh, and then I had a fourth great-grandfather who actually, after the war, became the father-in-law of the guy in the 56th Pennsylvania. Uh, his name was Daniel Servi, and he was a sergeant in the 4th Pennsylvania uh, 4th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And they were actually stationed on the southern part of uh, Cemetery Ridge. So he probably would have witnessed... I don't know if he would have witnessed Pickett's Charger if they were sent east to fight the cavalry battle against, uh, against Jeb Stewart. Yeah, forward, you're right. Um... I think yeah, I think I think it had to do with uh, with Hooker. I know Reynolds. I believe yeah. I think he he was the guy that most people expected to be given the command, and he didn't want it. And then uh, yeah, and Meade was basically voluntold. He was told he was taking the the command no matter what. And most people don't. I mean, I shouldn't say most people. Most people who aren't really in-depth studiers of the American Civil War don't realize that Meade held that position for the rest of the war. That uh, even at least surrender, Meade was still the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Um, it, you know, people just assume that he was replaced by Grant. He, he wasn't replaced by Grant. It's just that Grant, when he took command, overall command of the Union Army, he traveled with the Army of the Potomac. All right, so we did take McPherson Ridge here, so now he's going to have to shift some units down. These guys just not even getting in any action right now because everything's happening on my right. Sedgwick, yeah. So, well, and Sedgwick, uh, when the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg took place, because the Union Army was so spread out over a large area, like 20, 30, 40 miles um, they were divided into two wings. Sedgwick commanded one wing, and uh, Reynolds commanded the other wing. I believe Sedgwick was the most senior corps commander in the Army. Or maybe I'm think thinking of Slocum. Was Slocum the command? I don't know.
Sedgwick commanded the Sixth Corps. Uh, Slocum was the commander of the Twelfth Corps. Maybe I'm confusing Henry Slocum. I think maybe he was the commander of the other wing. Sedgwick, of course, was uh, famously killed a year later at Spotsylvania. And, of course, the uh, he was killed by a sharpshooter, and uh, it's said that he was in the middle of responding to a warning about the Confederate sharpshooters by saying they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance and that he was killed in mid-sentence, whether it's true or he was just kind of responding or had just responded. Still, he was loved. I mean, he was probably one of the most popular generals in the, in the Union Army, Sedgwick was. I think they called him Uncle John. All right, so we've got some time here. Uh, goodness, I've uh, lost about 1,600 men. I've wiped out half his army already. So the commanders, if I'm remembering right um, from my readings of Gettysburg, we had the, the first corps under Reynolds. Second corps was Hancock. And I believe this may have been his first... Corps Command, Hancock, so maybe the second, I don't know. It might have been that he was promoted before Chancellorsville. Uh, third Corps, of course, was uh, Dan Sickles, his last command, because he lost a leg here and really was never in command again after that. Um, a guy who was almost simultaneously court-martialed and given the Medal of Honor for the same battle, said or, uh, uh, Sickles. Uh, Fifth Corps was under Sykes. Sixth Corps was Sedgwick. Eleventh uh, Corps was Oliver Howard. And Twelfth uh, Corps was Slocum. Twelfth Corps was over um, over around uh, Culp's Hill on the right, right side of the army. So it looks like he's not really going to fight me for... Uh, here he comes. Here comes Pettigrew. Pettigrew was killed during the war. Uh, Archer was captured at the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, I guess he and Abner Doubleday knew each other. I think maybe they had gone to West Point together. Uh, and when Doubleday saw him and he said, I'm glad to see you, Archer. And I think Archer's reply was, well, I'm not glad to see you by a damn sight. Of course, that's one of the unique things about this war is you had so many men who had been good friends before the war. These guys are going to get driven off. That's okay. So I would expect that at some point here fairly soon, we're going to start seeing the, the Confederate Second Corps coming down here from the north. It's Yeah, it's 12 o'clock. They ought to be coming any time now, so I've got to watch for that. Yeah, it may have been after, after Fredericksburg that um, Hancock was promoted, and I know he hadn't been in command long. Now, the smart thing to do here for me would be to fall back to this position because I could do a lot more damage from back here, but uh, I think just with the manpower advantage that I have, I'll probably stay put. I'll watch this red bar. When this red bar shifts, I'll know that his men are coming down from the north. Of course, Hancock, uh, after the war, went into politics. He was the 1880 Democratic nominee for president. Very nearly won the election. Uh, he was narrowly defeated by James Garfield, who also, of course, had been a general during the Civil War uh, from Ohio. He, Garfield was also the, the House Minority Leader at the time of his election. I think Garfield had also just been elected to the Senate, but never took office because he got elected president instead. Garfield's a Northeast Ohio guy like myself, like uh, William McKinley, who was the very... Uh, McKinley was the last... Uh, Union veteran to be elected president. He and Rutherford B. Hayes were both in the 23rd Ohio together. It's kind of amazing when you think about the fact that there were 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these uh, infantry regiments and that two presidents came from the same exact unit. Man, I need my supplies. There they are. After it. Uh, Chris, I don't think it was after Antietam because I know I'm almost positive Hancock was only a division commander at Fredericksburg. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Hancock was in command of a division there. All right, we need to rush some of these other units up. His reinforcements from the Second Corps haven't arrived yet. 1230. I, I, I would have thought that they would have been in position by now. I'm going to go ahead and hold. I'm going to hold here right at this stream rather than falling back to, to Cemetery Hill. It's going to take a while for these guns to get get through all this i'll hold these guns back a little bit because these are rifled guns but i'll move the napoleons up let's see what's happening over here oh wiped out another unit look at these kills here 40th kentucky 600 kills 62 deaths wagner that's a little more even for wagner burnside 800 and 280 I think you're right forward about Sumner. Uh, and then I believe General Couch, Cooch, however you pronounce it, was the Grand Division Commander. Yeah, okay. Gabe, you're right. I, I My initial thought was Hancock, uh, that Gettysburg was his first Corps command. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to be sure of that now. Uh, and, of course, that, that shows just how you know much more gallant that feat of his on July 3rd was. Uh, his very first corps command, and, and they're warning him to get down. He says, no, there are times when a corps commander's life does not count. All right, here comes the, the second corps for the Confederates. They just showed up, about 5,000 men. But yeah, so Hancock very narrowly lost that 1880 uh, presidential election to Garfield. Of course, Garfield was assassinated a few months later. All right, so there's very little left on this side. In fact, if I get a chance, I'm probably going to ride forward and take out his guns. But let's go ahead and shift some more of these units over this way. Was Richardson a corps a cork commander at Antietam? I don't know. I was thinking he was a division commander, but I could be wrong. I know he, he was shot at the uh, the sunken lane. I remember that from my visit there. All right. I think Carol's probably safe to move out of here, too. I'm going to shift all of these guns over. I'm going to get these guys resupplied. Some of these units, these uh, cavalry units, Devon, um, they're going to get wiped out when they start getting hit, but that's okay. I'm just going to put them on the front lines until I get my other troops there. I'll probably lose these guys too, but that's okay. I'm going to send them after the... Iced Earth Gettysburg. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, um, and I believe, now how true this is or not, because sometimes I know um, history gets kind of mixed in with fiction, but um, if I remember right from reading the book, The Killer Angels, which is what the movie Gettysburg was based on, it wasn't just Hancock and Armistead. It was also Reynolds. It was kind of three of them that were all really good friends and were in the same uh, I want to say it was the 8th Infantry Regiment before the war out in California. So I think it was Hancock, Reynolds, and Armistead all together.
All right, here comes the second core. I don't have quite enough up here to deal with all that. Let's shift these guys over. Get some of these units mounted up so I can get them over. Yeah, and um, I think I've talked about this before, too, but for the new folks, maybe you didn't know this, but if you've seen the movie Gettysburg, Richard Jordan, the man who plays Armistead and who I think did a fantastic job in portraying Armistead, uh, that was his last movie performance. He actually died before the movie was released. Uh, he, he filmed that movie with a brain tumor. Uh, you may have seen, oh, they're going to try to sneak around. Oh, Okay, here's something I have to remember about this battle, and it's been a while, so I had forgotten this. They can sneak back here and take Cemetery Hill and win the battle if I'm not careful. So I've got to go back here and, and kind of cover my butt here. Um, but Richard Jordan, he also uh, had a prominent role in the movie uh, Hunt for Red October. Uh, I know he's been in other things, but that's the one I remember him from. All right, so obviously Carol's going to get tore up, but I'm, I'm sending him him uh, in wiping out all of these batteries that are sitting over here. Let's go get Macintosh. Pegram will hit me, but that's okay. Actually, I'll send Carol to hit Pegram. We'll send these guys to hit Macintosh. All right, so... The 17th Pennsylvania bought time for me to get these other units up. All right, here we go. Last phase of day one of the battle. Yeah, we got to get these guys over here to cover Cemetery Hill. All right, Gavin, stay where you are, buddy. Let's wipe out these batteries. Oh, look at Ramser coming over here and trying to make things miserable for me. Well, he's sending everybody he can over this way. Oh, geez, I didn't expect both of those units to get driven off like that. All right, we've got folks in a position now to guard this from any surprises. I'm going to keep a unit here. Let's send General Grant and General Buford up here. We can send Frank over this way as well. Even though I've got this huge advantage in manpower going into this day of the battle, it the way that it gives you the reinforcements, it keeps things pretty even for the Confederates. And I, I just lost Carol surrendered because I, I went in trying to deal with all those guys. We're going to have to send some folks over here to rescue them. There we go. Problem solved.
Now he's going to come back down here, try to take my first and ridge, which he can have. It doesn't help me win the battle. So there's the unit that I knew was going to sneak down there. It's Avery. I knew somebody would try to sneak down and take take the objective away. Let's get my artillery re resupplied. Get Garfield up. So it's interesting. Some... Some stories, of course, from the Civil War concern friendships from before the war that were strained during. So, for example, you had um, Armistead and Hancock, who had been really close friends before the war, uh, and then go their separate ways. And then you have stories of men who formed friendships because of the war, who were on opposite sides. Uh, and one of those stories really kind of starts here at Gettysburg, and that was... Francis Barlow, who was a Union division commander in the 11th Corps, uh, who was severely wounded on the first day of Gettysburg, and John Gordon, uh, who was, of course, a Confederate general, who was himself gravely wounded at Antietam, uh, who uh, I believe they, they encountered one another uh, when Barlow was wounded and then found himself behind the lines on the first day, and then after the war um, kind of encountered each other again. And I, one of my favorite stories of Gordon, of course, has to do with uh, the surrender at Appomattox. It was uh, Gordon's troops who were in the process of laying down their arms and in parade for surrender uh, who were saluted by the Union general who was receiving the surrender, which was Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And he called his men to attention. And then, of course, Gordon responded with attention of his own. And he Gordon would, would go on to say after the war, he called Chamberlain the knightliest soldier in the Union Army. Uh, the two men had a great deal of respect for one another. And it's interesting how that happens during war, that men could fight against each other uh, so f uh, ferociously and yet still have a great deal of respect for each other. I think almost all Union... Soldiers, certainly all Union generals had a lot of respect for Robert E. Lee. Of course, many of them had known each other before the war. So he can have McPherson Ridge back. All right, let's wipe out this battery. I'm going to come up here and hit Doles. Six U.S. Infantry, Chris, it may very well have been. I know it was an infantry regiment. Um, I just, my brain only rem remembers so many things, and that's just not one of those things that I've been able to remember is what unit um, they were in before the war. Hey, Tommy T., what is going on? How's it going? Just finishing up day one of the Battle of Gettysburg. I decided to hold my ground uh, in the north rather than falling back to Cemetery Hill. I'm pretty spread out, but it's been working out pretty well so far. Jeez, these 24-pounders have a 1,000 kills on day one. I have taken a lot of casualties. So we're going to go ahead and, I think, speed things along here. I'm well, Tommy. How about yourself? It's nice to be back doing a live stream. It's been entirely too long. All right, we're going to get Daniel into, into combat here. And I'll bring these guys up. Now let's, I don't have any of my melee cavalry yet. Those are all in the troops that I'll get later. 
I'm feeling like I could have used some of them right now, though. It'd be very nice to have them right now because his units are so spread out and so weak that I could just destroy him with a decent amount of melee cavalry. The overhaul mod. Um, I have... Uh, I don't know which exactly which mod that is. I have one mod installed uh, that does a couple of minor things. Uh, primarily, you can see when I click on my artillery, you can see the, the different lines showing the range of the different types of, of uh, artillery fire. I know there's something else it does besides that, but I'm just drawing a blank as to... Um, yeah, there, uh, forward there are a few mods, nothing like major. Um, just recently they've come out. And they're not as easy to install as they are for things like Hearts of Iron. I got to get over here and get these guys resupplied. Where are my supplies? Oh, my, my supplies are here. Oh, they're just not in range of Burnside. Tommy, the next place I go to, um, you mean on the game or you mean like in terms of my travel that I'm doing? Because after this, we go to the, uh, we go to Chickamauga <laughs> on the battle. J&P rebalance mod, that's it. I think that's the one that I have on here. Come on, we got to get Burnside resupplied. Oh, skills and brigade sizes. Okay. I don't know if that's the one I have installed or not. I'll travel. Um, I'm, I'm staying local. Uh, I'll only be in Ohio and Pennsylvania the rest of this year. Unless, I shouldn't say only because um, sometimes things will come up. So it may be that I get other places, but... Uh, I was pretty local the whole fall. I was only in Ohio and Pennsylvania this year, but next year I will definitely in 2019 be back to traveling all over, which um, for my family is not necessarily good, but as far as me being able to make videos at historical locations, it's a good thing because it means I'll be back, back to traveling all over the country and get those opportunities that I haven't had this year to visit places. Very much hoping I'll, I'll get another opportunity to go uh, to places like Massachusetts. There's a lot of history I didn't get to. All right, we just wiped out another unit. I got to go to Massachusetts once, and it was really great. I had one day uh, to hit as much history as I could. And so in one day, um, I went to downtown Boston. I went to the site of the, the Boston Massacre. Uh, the Granary Burying Ground, which is where a lot of the famous um, folks from Boston are buried. Uh, I went down to Plymouth and got to see, uh, of course, Plymouth Rock, um, the site of the Plymouth Colony. Uh, I got to go to the uh, Adams historical location, so where John, John Adams, John Quincy Adams lived and are buried. Uh, and then I got over to Lexington and Concord briefly at the end of the day. So we've got an hour left, and then we go to day two in this battle. I'm not really going to pursue trying to wipe out his army here. i got to back up, though, because I'm, I'm in range of his artillery here. Okay. We're going to come back and, and get some resupply going on this side now. The USS Constitution is in dry dock out there. Okay, interesting. I did not know that. I got to see the Mayflower 2, which is on display there in Plymouth. It's supposed to be a pretty close rep replica of the original. Of course, a lot of people don't know there were two ships. Uh, there was the Mayflower, and then there was a smaller ship that went with the Mayflower called the Speedwell. Uh, the Speedwell sprung a leak, and they had to go back. And I actually had an ancestor by the name of Thomas Blossom 
who was a deacon in the church in Holland when they were there. And uh, he was on the Speedwell, and he actually stayed behind, wrote some letters to Governor Bradford. Uh, Blossom is not only my ancestor, he's also the ancestor of the previous two U.S. presidents, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Uh, so through Thomas Blossom, I'm a distant cousin, like an eighth or ninth cousin to each of those men. Um, Forest Hill Cemetery, is that in, uh, is that in Boston? I went, uh, when I was in Boston, I went to the Granary Burying Ground. That's where um, Samuel Adams is buried. Um, Patrick Henry, not Patrick Henry. Um, oh, gosh. Um, uh, you know, the guy who made the, the ride. Paul Revere um, is buried there. So is, um, I think, Benjamin Franklin's grandmother is buried there. And the five men uh, who were killed during what became known as the Boston Massacre, they're buried there as well. Uh, and then I went to the cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts, which actually has up on a hill within about 50 feet, you have all these famous writers. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, uh, I, I'm, trying, I'm drawing a blank now on who all of them are, but there's four or five of them all buried in one place. All right, so uh, proceeding to the next day, I'm going to take about a three-minute break, go... Uh, Take care of a couple of things, and then we'll move on here in just a second. All right, I'm back, but I'm going to give it another minute or so here before we get moving on. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, Tommy, you're talking about Forest Hill Cemetery. I'll have to check that if I'm if I'm there again. Hey, be nuts or what is up? We're getting ready to head to day two of the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm heading back to camp here. I'm going to take a look at the status of some of my units. If I remember right, um, I think somebody mentioned this after the last one. Uh, if you're if the it was something about the uh, the units if they're if they're on foot or if they're mount, uh, whatever it is, depending on the formation, you can't um, upgrade them during the battle. Uh. Lost a lot of commanders during that one. I'll be careful on funds because I'm kind of low right now. I'm just going to put these guys up to 500 for now. 500 is as high as it'll let you go on the uh, mounted units. If they were dismounted when the battle ended, I guess, is how that works. Because I think it considers them infantry or something. Okay, I think we'll kind of stick right there with all of that. 
Let's get into day two. All right, so he's only got 14,000 men to my 35. So once again, going to be kind of a bloodbath here. We're now defending uh, Cemetery Ridge. Now you can see all the way up here to the angle, which is this is where, where Pickett's Charge took place right here. Now I'm going to have all of my... Um, my uh, melee cavalry units in position here. We're going to pull back from this awful position of Dan Sickles. Of course, now the trick is here that I don't have a lot of um, units to defend with because I've got a lot of melee cavalry. I probably should have mixed that better in my build for this battle. But that'll come with reinforcements. I'm going to pull these 20 pounders back. Actually, I got to sit these guys up here closer to the objective. So I've got him outnumbered, but again, you can see early on in the fight I don't have him outnumbered, and having a lot of melee cavalry makes this going to means this is going to be an interesting one. I'm going to park them back here. These guys have sh sawed off shotguns, so they're not even well equipped. So there's a little round top right here, of course, historically held by, um, I think it was Weed and Vincent's brigades. Strong Vincent was the commander of the brigade in the 5th Corps that the 20th Maine was a part of. And I, I, a lot of this stuff I know I've mentioned before, but for the folks that are new, I mention it again. Um, there are certain things about... Uh, yes, Chris, second phase, that's right. Um, we're on day 2, July 2nd. Um, yeah, this is the southwest side of the battlefield. And um, a lot of people don't realize this. And, and there are certain certain things about certain battles that you really can only fully understand when you go there. Uh, a perfect example of that is... I'm going to get overrun over here, I think, if I don't have some help. So, uh, A perfect example of that is going to Antietam and standing at what, the, what we call Burnside Bridge and seeing what it was that those men were attacking. Uh, and you can understand why so few troops could hold that position when you go there. Um, another place like that is Little Round Top. Standing on Little Round Top, the first time you stand there and you look out over the battlefield, you at once understand, as they did, the, the strategic importance of that position. I'm going to move some guns over this way, uh, even though these are 20-pounders. They can do a lot of damage. I'm actually going to pull Poe over here too because there's nothing to be gained by defending here. And uh, the other thing about Little Round Top is that I know, at least for me growing up, I always pictured that they were the, the, the troops were standing on top of Little Round Top and that was where they defended from. They didn't. And that was typical. That wasn't the way it was done. Uh, they were about a third to one half of the way down the face of Little Round Top is where they were actually defending. And it had something to do with the way, the, 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 the sight lines uh, and how men coming up the hill could view uh, who they were firing on. It, I, I don't remember the details of what that is, but it had something to do with that, why they did it that way. Uh, and so if you go to Little Round Top and you stand up where all the monuments are, which is on the top of the ridge, you look down and you can actually see uh, the markers that they have that show the left and right flank of each regiment, uh, which is one of the cool things about Gettysburg is that when you go there, you can you can see exactly where each unit was positioned during the battle because they put left and right flank markers. And these were actually troops. Most of those markers, most of the monuments, were placed by men who had been there. They weren't placed you know, a long time after by people who knew nothing about it. Yeah, Chris, exactly. All 
uh, his artillery is firing on me. So I'm going to get these 20 pounders, uh, this rifled artillery firing down on him. See if we can kind of counter battery fire. I'm going to, I'm going to ride around, I think with these guys and see if maybe I can come up and, and surprise him in the rear a little bit. This is big round top here. Looks like Anderson's coming up big round top. So Law's brigade on the Confederate side attacked down through this little saddle between Big Round Top and Little Round Top because this is where the 20th Maine was. They were actually kind of on the um, almost on the the southeast corner of Little Round Top, uh, kind of facing directly south, and then kind of hooked around a little bit right here. Joking Joker has returned. Oh, it's not a party till you arrive, Joker. Welcome back. We'll do another live stream later this week sometime, and I'll do some Hearts of Iron because I know that's what you like anyway. All right, here comes a charge. All right, we're going to have to get this these 20-pounders turned and firing, some, uh, firing on these guys. They're going to break through here. McClellan's running. Look at him run. All right, come on, you chicken. Get back here and fight. Oh, and there's a Vander Law there. Wow, Anderson just got lit up. Big time. My goodness. He just lost half his force in a matter of minutes. Man, if, there's Devil's Den right here. Fallout 76. Yes, sir, I will do that. I'm home a lot now, so uh, I do have Fallout 76. Uh, I'm not a great Fallout player because I don't get much of a chance to do that, but I will definitely watch for you because I, I do believe we're friends on Xbox Live. So he's throwing everything he's got at Little Round Top, and I've only got three brigades defending it, which is actually more than the Union actually had. I think they only had two brigades. I think Weed and Vincent were the only ones that were there. I'm keeping these guys with their shot, sawed-off shotguns kind of in the rear. 7th Cavalry is going to go grab these supplies. Of course, think when you think 7th Cavalry, you think of Custer. And uh, George Armstrong Custer did make a name for himself at Gettysburg, led a, a cavalry charge at the cavalry battle uh, that was over a few miles east of the main battlefield. They were intercepting... Uh, Jeb Stewart, who had finally arrived, and he, he was actually trying to ride around the Union Army with a plan of trying to hit the Union Army in the rear during Pickett's charge. Of course, he got intercepted by the Union Cavalry. We're surprising his artillery and his supplies. Chris, I think I think that mod is the rebalance mod. I can't promise you that I'm right about that though. Um, it was a while back somebody mentioned to me about looking at that mod, and that was the one I found and and installed. Do I have an Xbox headset? Yes, I do. I don't typically when I'm on I'm not using it but I do have one I've got a uh, I think it's a turtle beach it cost me like a hundred bucks it's got it's a it's a Bluetooth headset so it's wireless oh man he's really kind of ganging up on me here this may be a mistake but I'm I may I don't know if I bring these guys down too Maybe that's enough melee cavalry to just completely wipe out his attack if I hit them all at once. But he's got a lot of guys back here, so that makes me a little nervous to do that. And I don't know how well cavalry is going to operate in Devil's Den. Seems like these guys are holding, at least somewhat. 
these 20 pounders are taking some casualties because I've got them up a little closer than I would normally have 20 pounders. I didn't build my army the best way. I should have put in a bunch of smooth bores here and had more of these melee cavalry units available on day one. So I'm just trying to disrupt things over here right now. Even though it's going to cost me some casualties. Uh, did I start 76? Yeah, I'm like level 6, I think. So I've, I've got maybe just a couple of hours into it so far. I know this cavalry can't possibly operate well in Devil's Den. But I can at least disrupt his artillery. And disrupt enough of his attack to keep them from being able to do anything. Interesting that Barksdale's here at Little Round Top. Because historically Barksdale, he was part of the attack that was much further north. He was killed that day. Or at least mortally wounded and died later on. Maybe a day later. Well, it looks like the cavalry's at least doing a little something at Devil's Den. Hey, Ike Lieberman, what is going on? Welcome, glad you're here. All right, I'm going to lose Crittenden. Uh, he, that, that unit's going to be wiped out, and that's a two-star cavalry unit, too. And maybe they'll get out of there. If he gets another volley into them, I'm going to lose him. All right, I did enough to disrupt his attack, though. Which was mainly what I was after there. Here comes a little bit of reinforcement. I want to get Crittenden out of danger. Yes, finally I stream again. It has been too long. But the good news is because of that um, that shadow uh, software, which if you guys saw my channel update yesterday, I, I showed a little bit about that. Because of that, I'm now going to be able to make videos even when I'm traveling uh, because I can use my, my crappy little uh, work la laptop and actually record videos um, because I can just sign into my my Shadow Tech desktop. All right, I think these are these sharpshooters. Oh, they've got hunters, so yeah. All right, I'm gonna ride Hood up here. The cavalry ride up and over the top of Little Round Top. To disrupt the melee attack. Uh, Joker, only vaguely. I played Fallout 4 uh, some, so I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it. But not as much as hardcore players are. I, I actually have a brother who, uh, who has a, a... He live streams playing Fallout a lot. So he's a lot more versed in these things than I am. All right, we gotta back Jackson up. Yeah, I hear you, Chris. But And, you know, honestly, I was a little leery about how, you know, I was thinking, honestly, how well could this really work? But if you have a good Internet connection, it works really well. It, it doesn't feel any different than if you were using a real computer. And when I was installing games from my Steam library, 
the download speed was ridiculous. Now I have I have pretty fast internet here at home, but nothing like what I was able to download onto that thing. It was it was pushing a gigabyte a second. It was crazy fast. This is not going to go well for my melee cavalry, but I needed to do this. I wanted to wipe these guys out. Nice, Joker. That sounds good. All right, let's come up here and finish off Wooford. We're going to wipe out all of these units, I think. Unless they fall back into the woods where I can't hit them. Oh, DSL. Yeah, that that makes it a little more difficult. We are in big trouble. Well, not really. But here comes the attack on Cemetery, uh, Cemetery Ridge now. Anderson's division. So, uh, obviously, one of the, I feel, untold stories. I mean, it's not untold, but doesn't get the press that the 20th Maine does. Is, is of course, the first Minnesota. And I'm so disappointed... There's, there's very little that I can really complain about the film Gettysburg. I think it was really well done. Um, I, it's, to me, by far the best Civil War movie ever made. Um, but one criticism I have is that they didn't show the first Minnesota. And I, I understand that uh, none of the characters that they kind of use as a point of view character. Uh, well, that's not entirely true because Hancock... Uh, they could have used Hancock in that story, the first Minnesota. Um, but what the first Minnesota did on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg should not nearly be as obscure a story as it has become. Um, it should be much more known than it is. But anyway, um, because... Long story short, for any of you who may not be familiar with what happened, um, because Dan Sickles had moved his core out to this position here, and I guess I should back up. Um, the, the way the Union Army was positioned, it was the second core here. The third core was supposed to be here and anchoring the south end of the third core line here at Little Round Top. Well, Dan Sickles took it upon himself to move his entire core out to here. Uh, which, of course, left a gap and, and left this area undefended. Well, he didn't know at the time that Longstreet's uh, assault, the First Corps, with two of his divisions, McClaws and Hood, were coming down with the idea of attacking around the Union left. And, uh, and, and so what happened was that as the Third Corps, uh, and, and all of this, I made a video about it. If you go and look, I, I made a video standing at the, so, uh, the site of the First Minnesota uh, monument. Uh, so go look for that. Just type in history guy, first Minnesota, and you'll see it or, or cemetery Ridge. Um, so when, when Hick Sickles third Corps was driven back from this position, they pretty much crumbled. There was a gap that was left here on the Southern part of cemetery Ridge and general Hancock, who commanded the second Corps, uh, sent for reinforcements from over here at Culp's Hill. They weren't, they hadn't arrived yet. And so in the meantime, he sees Anderson's division coming across, and they are in prime position to split the Union Army in half. Uh, they're going to drive right into that gap in the center and, uh, and put a break right between the two flanks of the Union Army. And so Hancock rides up to Colonel Colville of the 1st Minnesota. They had like 260 men. And he orders him to charge this Confederate brigade as it's coming across. So something like 1,000, 1,300 men coming across. And these 262 Minnesotans are ordered to fix bayonets and charge. And they charge headlong right into this brigade and uh, end up suffering something like 70 to 80% casualties. They lost like 200 of their 262 men. But they, they bought time 
for the reinforcements from Culp's Hill to come over and solidify this position and saved the Union position on uh, Cemetery Ridge through their actions that day. But not only that, the 1st Minnesota stayed in position, and they were there when Pickett's Charge comes the next day on July 3rd, and they actually helped repulse Pickett's Charge and lost a couple of dozen more men uh, on the, the, the third day of the battle. Again, I don't... Oh, I do have supplies. I think they're up here. So let's get the supplies down here. Not a lot going to be happening here, I think. Uh, joking Joker, I do ha have a Discord server, but I, it's been so long since I've been in Discord. But I do have Discord. If you just use the link uh, in most of the descriptions uh, of all my videos, there's a Discord. Ike, uh, yeah, that's very cool. Uh, so are you, you're German? Um, where do you live in Germany? I, I, I'm slowly but surely um, learning German. A uh, great deal of my ancestry comes from Germany. Um, very, very much hope to visit Germany someday. Oh, he's going to get these supplies back. Oh, well, you can have them, dude. No big loss there. Doesn't seem like a lot's gonna happen here until we get to uh, until we get to Pickett's Charge on day three. So we'll start uh, simming a little faster. I probably should send help up here. Oh boy, didn't see him coming after my uh, artillery there. Ah, oh, reinforcements finally arrive. Yeah, it's going to get ugly now, folks. This would uh, basically be the equivalent of the reinforcements, I guess, from... Was it the 6th Corps that sent a bunch of reinforcements, I think? Man, alive. Look at all that. Could have used all that a while ago. Guten Abend. I've got my kids saying Guten Morgen to me every morning now when they wake up. Most of my family is from, uh, like, down around Stuttgart, I believe. I'll have to look and see if I can find the name of the town. I'm doing three things here at once. I'm on my phone trying to look up the name of that town. I'm talking to you guys and following the chat and then also trying to direct an army. But I think for the most part, this second day of the battle is over. All right, I'm going to look that up real quick. Confederate Third Corps attacked them in the south. Let's move up. We got to get a little closer on this guy. Once all these guns get into position, it's going to be interesting.
Yeah, Stuttgart. Um, it's it's near Stuttgart. I'm gonna look up the town here. I'm doing that while simultaneously directing the battle on full speed. I'll push forward on these guys a little more. Oh, here comes Dorsey Pender, huh? All right. Where is that? Uh, maybe if I look at a map, I'll find it. 46 minutes, then we got to go fight on Culp's Hill. This is a really long battle. I forgot how long it was. Oh, that's what it's called. It's, uh, I, I'm going to butcher the uh, pronunciation, but uh, Guggenbach, a Guggenbach. It's, um, it's uh, almost halfway between Stuttgart and, uh, actually, if you drew a triangle between Frankfurt and, Stuttgart and Nuremberg. It'd be right near the middle of that triangle. It's it's south, maybe 40 miles south of Würzburg. All right, 15 more minutes, and then we get to the next phase of this battle. Hopefully, we'll have something to fight here. Have I ever made the July 4th attack as the Union? No, I haven't. Uh, maybe we'll do that today. A Confederate or Union uniform on 76 and a musket. That would be interesting. All right. Now we go over to Culp's Hill on the right flank. So once again, major advantage. I outnumber him almost four to one, six to one on guns. But again, it doesn't give you all those troops right off the bat. So it always kind of helps the Confederates out by giving a little bit of um, kind of a delay to the Union reinforcements. I got to back up and get into these fortifications. Oh, good. I've got sharpshooters here. That actually works out nicely on Culp's Hill. There's my one unit of infantry. That's the Irish Brigade, which I've never reinforced. I just kind of use it until the troops are all gone. I need to get some uh, supplies over here. All right, here comes some reinforcements already. 
Um, Joker, uh, let's go Confederate. Yeah, I know uh, German's a tricky one, but English being a Germanic language, I think there's less of a learning curve for English speakers than there might be for some other uh, speakers of other languages because so many of the words are similar. going to take a while to get these units over there. All right, so it looks like right now I've got them almost three to one. And I don't even have half the troops that I'm supposed to get for this phase. Sharpshooters are just going to have a field day. You can see they've these guys already have 140 kills. These guys have 86. Once I get more artillery up there, it's just going to get even worse for them. I'm going to move some more of these guns up here. That's all right. That gives me an incentive to work on my leveling on that game. Let's get these guys moved up so we can get into position to attack. So, Stuart, this is a Maryland brigade, Maryland, Confederate Marylanders. And, of course, I think they were f squaring off against Union Maryland troops over here at Culp's Hill. Of course, Culp's Hill is the site of one of those little stories that um, that really illustrates how this was a brother against brother civil war. Um, be nuts or uh, wire. I don't think they did too much. Um, I think barbed wire really was kind of something that came along with the First World War. <laughs> Joker, I like the way you think. That's good. Um, I don't think the Kaiser Reich will be coming under Angela Merkel anytime soon. So, uh, anyway, so uh, Wesley Culp. Wesley Culp grows up on Culp's Hill or in that area. I believe his uncle owned the farm. Uh, my wife's actually related to the Culp family. They were cousins of hers. Uh, the name the name was originally Kolb. It was K O L B, which is German. Uh, by the time of the Civil War, a lot of the family had anglicized it to Culp. But a lot of the early graves there is still Kolb. And my wife's branch of the family, who came from Gettysburg to uh, here in Northeast Ohio, actually retained the name Kolb. Um, so Wesley Culp grows up in the Gettysburg area. He goes to Virginia a few years before the war for work. When the Civil War breaks out, he enlists in the Confederate Army. He marches north with the uh, Army of Northern Virginia and finds himself fighting on the family farm uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg and he's mortally wounded right there on the very land that he grew up uh, a part of. He also happened to be good friends with Jenny Wade and Jack Skelly who was her fiance um, and of course within a couple of weeks of each other all three were dead. Jack Skelly had been mortally wounded uh, uh, I think over around Harper's Ferry uh, during the Gettysburg campaign or in one of the battles in the Shenandoah Valley. And, uh, of course, Jenny Wade was, was killed by a stray bullet. Her house was down here on the south end of Gettysburg near Cemetery Hill, uh, and she was mortally wounded by a bullet that came through the door. Oh, yeah, forward for sure. Um 1864 was a preview of the trench warfare of World War One in a lot of ways. 
because finally the tactics started to catch up with the weaponry. That was why the Civil War was so horrendous. And I think to a degree the World War I was as well, is that you had weapons that were far in advance of the tactics of the time. And so the tactics kind of had to catch up to where the weapons were. All right, we need to get some supplies over here to these guns. Pretty quiet here at Culp's Hill. Uh, of course, that was one of the major blunders of Gettysburg, was the failure of the Confederate Army to secure Culp's Hill uh, on July 1st. And, of course, most people, uh, the standard line of thinking with that is uh, that it was the the change in leadership leadership from Stonewall Jackson to... Yule and Hill uh, at the core command level that really resulted in that because because Lee had a way of communicating to Stonewall Jackson that gave Jackson the maximum latitude in making decisions about tactics on the ground where he was uh, and Lee kind of expected the same decision making the same audacity the same um, aggressiveness from Yule and it didn't happen and so he gave this order to Ewell to take this hill if practicable. And of course, Stonewall Jackson would have said, well, heck yeah, I'm taking that hill. And he would have done it. But Ewell was much more cautious. It was his first uh, battle in command of a corps. Uh, he was back from losing a leg at 2nd Manassas. And uh, all of these factors kind of played into him being cautious and not taking the, the hill. And so then the Confederates spent two days trying to take a hill they could have easily had the first day of the battle. No, you're right, Chris. Um, I agree. Uh, and I think had Longstreet had his way, they would not have attacked, attacked the Union at Gettysburg. Uh, if they would have fell back after the initial contact on July 1st, and gotten between the Union Army and Washington, they would have forced Meade into a, an attack mode, and he would have, uh, then Lee would have had the the ground of his own choosing. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Forward, uh, if Early had been in command, probably would have been a different story. Early was certainly much more aggressive. You can see that a year later um, with what he did in 1864. But, yeah, I think the bottom line is, yeah, the Battle of Gettysburg from the Confederate standpoint should never have happened in the first place. Man, sharpshooters are having themselves a day, man. Look at this, 441 kills. 383. All right, we're going to speed this up, and I believe we're going to be on to Pickett's Charge. Look at his supplies riding right out in front of me trying to drag me out. Not going to happen, guys. Sorry. We're going to get ourselves on to July 3rd. All right, we still are we still live on YouTube? Um, my my YouTube's telling me okay. I, I guess it is. It was saying offline for me, so but I guess we're okay because none of you are complaining that you can't see me anymore. All 
All right, we're down to 20 minutes. We're going to get into uh, July 3rd here in just a minute, which is going to be another just awful bloodbath mess for the Confederates. This is honestly is the perfect battle for me as a live stream because um, when I'm live streaming, I can't really pay much attention. And, and this is such an easy battle for me as far as the numbers that it, it's perfect for a live stream. Yeah, for sure, forward, definitely. Such a missed opportunity for the Confederates. And, and after Gettysburg, uh, it became a numbers game. They, they just couldn't keep up uh, with what was happening. There was no way for them to... And Grant knew that. I, I've never been all that impressed by Grant as a tactician. Uh, Grant's strength was his understanding of the situation and his willingness to make hard choices. Uh, tactically, he wasn't a great general, but he knew what he knew what needed to be done to win the war, and he did it. I think if Grant had been in command in 1862 in the Peninsula Campaign, the war would have ended in 1862. Oh, we got to finish off Culp's Hill. Grant was pretty much the opposite of McClellan. All right. I got to pull these guns out. We're going to speed this along. There we go. Wasn't a great general, Cold Harbor much? <laughs> yeah, Grant said that, he said, yeah, if it were up to me, I, I never would have made that last charge at Cold Harbor. Do you think? I think if that were up to anybody with, like, one day in the army, they wouldn't have made that charge at Cold Harbor. History kid, what is going on? Joker, I'll check that out when I get a chance. Um, little, little, got my hands a little full here with the battle and with uh, live streaming, but I will definitely check it out first chance I get. Does that have something to do with... Uh, Wolfenstein as far as the game, uh, Wolfenstein. Man, I remember that from my uh, teenage years playing Wolfenstein. <laughs> A union success. Wink, wink. I got to go to Cold Harbor. Unfortunately, it was before I had this channel. And so I, I wasn't there, you know, making videos to show. Uh, but I actually got to meet. There were um, there were some folks there from England uh, and so I was kind of talking through with them what happened at Cold Harbor. We were standing uh, on the Confederate side, or no, on the Union side, uh, looking over at the Confederate trenches at Cold Harbor, which also was, I believe, was the battlefield of Gaines Mill. Uh, was fought at the same place. Ike, yes, for the most part, uh, not always. You know, Gettysburg's an example where both sides called it the same thing. But for the most part, Confederates named their, theirs after bodies of water, which is interesting because then the Union, for the most part, named their armies after ba bodies of water. The Confederates tended to name theirs after regions. So you have the Army of Northern Virginia versus the Union Army of the Potomac. Now it gets really confusing because at the beginning of the war, the Confederates had an army of the Potomac and the Union had an army of Northern Virginia. So at first bull run, you had the Union Army of Northern Virginia against the Confederate Army of the Potomac. And then a year later, you have the Union Army of the Potomac fighting against the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, so, uh, for example, the Confederates had the Army of Tennessee 
The Union had the Army of the Tennessee, named after the river, uh, the Army of the Ohio, things like that. Uh, as far as battles go, you have Pittsburgh Landing, as it was known in the south. It was called uh, Shiloh in the north, which neither one of those are bodies of water. So it's always just confusing. But yeah, Antietam is a creek, as it was known in the north. The south called it Sharpsburg. Um, Bull Run was known in the north. Manassas, uh, named after the creek, it, or as, um, after the place in the south. Um, another example, Stones River is what it was known in the north, but it was called Murfreesboro in the south. So we've got an hour to go. No, no Confederates to fight unless I choose to pursue them, which I'm not going to. All right, we're just, I think this will go to Pickett's Charge after this, which is a terrible name for that because it wasn't Pickett's Charge. It was Longstreet's Assault because only one of the three divisions was under Pickett. But I think Longstreet was perfectly okay with it being known as Pickett's Charge. Uh, Joker, I don't have my phone at the moment, so uh, unfortunately I'll have to wait because my son's got it right now. He's watching some videos in another room, but when he gets it back, I will. All quiet on Culp's Hill right now. So Culp's Hill, you go there at the uh, battlefield. They've actually got a tower that you can climb up on top of Culp's Hill, and you can kind of see the whole area. Spangler Spring is there, and you can drink water from that. History Kid, I'm sure it probably was. Um, I, I'm sure Longstreet wanted no part of that. Of course, Longstreet was vilified in the south after the war um for two reasons number one because he spoke out publicly against robert e lee uh and his decision making at gettysburg which was a no-no you didn't talk about the old man that way especially because lee lee died just a couple of years after the war ended uh and so he kind of became this martyr this hero after the war and um the other thing was longstreet became a republican which was a big no-no because um politically at the time, basically, the pro-Union folks were Republicans, and the pro-South, uh, the pro-appeasement, pro-peace uh, side in the North were the Democrats. And almost everybody in the South was a Democrat at that time. So um, for Longstreet to basically become a Republican was to betray many of, his, uh, many of the, the people of the South, at least in their minds, that's how they viewed it. Um, Oh, the screaming in the background, that was probably my son. <laughs> yeah, he died in 1870. All right, so let's pause here so we can get everybody in position. I got to get everybody moved up and ready for this attack. Here's the angle right here. This is where kind of the high water mark of the Confederacy, as it's known, took place right here. This is where Pickett's uh, division hit. It's where Long or, uh, Armistead uh, kind of crossed over the stone wall and briefly broke the Union position. Got a lot of uh, melee cavalry here. I've got to get them somewhere. I'm going to move Canfield up. So I've got I've got enough backup troops here that I can back up any position that gets broken through. But I don't think any of them are going to make it that far. 
Good knocks. Uh, they should make a new movie, How Custer Got a Bloody Nose at Little Bighorn. Good night, sir. Yeah, don't ever feel bad about sharing something. Don't assume everybody knows something. You know, obviously, I'm sharing a lot of stuff that I know a lot of you guys know already. Uh, so it's not, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing stuff, um, sharing information, because there may be somebody here who doesn't know some of these things. And so it's good to, to learn a little more about history. Uh, I learn something new every day. It was only a year or two ago that I, you know, I've, I've been to Gettysburg probably 15 times. I've been reading books about it all my life. Uh, it's something even from 12 years old. So for the last 30 years that I've been studying and learning about, and it was only about two years ago that I learned that the men at Little Round Top were not standing on top of that hill. Some of you may have known that for a long time. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we just take for granted that people know and maybe they don't. So we're going to light these guys up. They're, they're never even going to get the, get across Chris, it wasn't really during Reconstruction. Um, it was, I mean, up until as late as the 1960s, the Democrats were still kind of the uh, the party of the South. Um, and it, it, it's it, you can't really just say it, it's. I think oversimplistic to say that the the party swapped. Things have changed. Uh, there have been, I believe, five what they call party systems. Uh, every generation or two, the parties change. Um, so, you know, you had the first party system where you had the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists here in America. Uh, then, of course, it changed when Andrew Jackson came along and the Democratic Party became what it was. Um, it would be fair to say that during the Civil War, the more conservative party was the Democrats and the more liberal party was the Republicans. Uh, so in that sense, it has changed. But I don't think it's quite as simple as just saying that they kind of flip-flopped. But parties do change. Uh, I, can, I think you can kind of see that again now. Um, it's too early to tell because you need years to go by to see these things. But um, to some degree, some of the areas of the United States that have been very pro-worker, pro-Democrat for several generations, uh, kind of switched and voted Republican in this last election. So you see that happen every 20, 40 years. There are shifts in the parties in terms of their political positions on different things. The Whigs, yes! So here he comes, but he's he's not, he's not going to get there. Uh, my my artillery is going to tear him up before he gets close. Hey, Gallant, what is up? Better late than never, sir. We are on the tail end. We're uh, just decimating what's left of the uh, Confederate Army at Pickett's Charge. He's only got 3,000 men left. None of these units are going to make it that far. And if they do, we'll just ride out with the melee cavalry and have a little fun. There's General Armistead. There goes General Armistead. All right, let's bring Canfield up. But there certainly have been periods of American history where one party dominated over the other. Um, after the Civil War, the Republicans dominated for a good 40 years. Almost every uh, president elected between 1868 and um, 1912, with the exception of Grover Cleveland, every president was a Republican and not just a Republican, but up through William McKinley, every Republican president had been a Civil War veteran, uh, most of them generals. Uh, Garfield, Hayes, Grant, 
um, Harrison and McKinley had all been un- uh, officers in the Union Army during the Civil War. When Washington elected, there weren't there weren't really parties. I am going to crush them on July Fourth, John. I'm going to do that. Um, did I get the option to show some Bufording delaying action? Well, I did delay as much as I could. I, I If you go back later when this video goes live and watch from the beginning, you'll see I held on the north and west of town. I never fell back to Cemetery Hill during the first day battle. Um, but yeah, um, the, the parties kind of formed around Alexander Hamilton during the Washington administration. Uh, they formed around Hamilton and Jefferson. Uh, you had the Federalists, primarily led by Alexander Hamilton, and the Anti-Federalists, who were kind of led by um, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. And then eventually, then it became the Democrats and the Whigs. The Democrats had been the Democratic Republicans, which were the Anti-Federalists to begin with. Uh, and then they largely became the, the, the Southern Party at that time, uh, kind of focusing on the interests of the South. I think we're at the point now where we can probably go ahead and ride out with the melee cavalry and wipe out what's left of his army. I'm going to keep the 1st Virginia Cavalry back just because they've lost a lot of troops. But yes, I'm definitely going to do John the uh, July 4th this time around. I believe Posey had Florida units in his uh, brigade. There weren't a lot of Florida units in the Civil War because there weren't a lot of people in Florida during the Civil War. Florida wasn't the major population center that it is now. All right, how many has he got left? He's got 1,400 men left. We're going to wipe out his army. we got an hour and 20 minutes. It's a race against time. We're going to ride over there and capture Robert E. Lee at this rate. I do wish, just speaking personally, without getting into politics, which I try to avoid uh, on this channel for the most part, I do wish there were more than two parties. I think we really hurt ourselves here in America with only two parties. Really limit our options. Uh, what do I think of Sherman's March to the Sea? I think it was what needed to be done. I think Sherman understood war better than most. I think it's exactly what happened during World War II, and I think it would never happen today. Uh, our view of what is acceptable in war has changed. I mean, today, you, uh, you bomb a target and you kill one or two civilians and all hell breaks loose. World War II, we literally firebombed cities on purpose to end the war. I mean, what happened, what what the U.S. and British air forces did to Dresden in Germany is just, you can't even fathom. And, you know, people like to talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and what was done with the uh, atomic bombs, but what we did to cities like Dresden was just horrifying um, in an effort to end that war. And that was really just Sherman's march to the sea on a larger scale. Yeah, Chris, you're absolutely right. They will keep it status quo. It's it's in their advantage to do so. All right, so there's 9,000 men now that I've got to go after. So now we're going to do what I've never done on this game, which is to try and pursue this now. Uh, really limited on time, if I remember right, in doing this. So Actually, we've already got it, so... 
This is kind of interesting. Let's ride ahead. He's only got 3,000 men. Let's see if we can go find him. Get the rest of my melee cavalry out here. Oh, we found somebody. Oh, there's a thousand men there. Look at that. So that's that's literally a third of the men that he has on the battlefield right now. I'm doing what Lincoln wished Meade would have done, which is to pursue the enemy. Try and hit him before he gets across the flooded Potomac River. Yeah, exactly, John. Um, you know, people people like their um, their stories. You know, the narrative to be a certain thing from history, and and so people like to focus on the atom bombs, and they don't think a lot about all of the fire bombing that happened long before the atomic bombs. Oh, I guess it's going to end it right there. All right. So let's take a look at the numbers. We grabbed lots and lots of weapons, lots of supplies, which is good. That'll come in handy down the road. A lot of casualties in that one. It's not going to show any of my losses because I had to replace a lot of guys. But let's look at this. Look at that. Those 20 pounders, 1,837 kills, one loss. 40th Kentucky, 17. Now, I love this because I actually, my ancestor was in the 40th Kentucky Mounted Infantry. Um, actually, two ancestors were. So, um, 24 losses, 1,700 kills. Man, look at these. Oh, that's just as beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So, here's where things stand. Oh, I'm, I'm maxed out at 100. Um, so I got to spend down some of these reputation points. Oh, we could get, we got to get George Thomas because we have to have the Rock of Chickamauga when we get to Chickamauga. So we're going to gobble him up right now. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up right there. Uh, it's been an awesome time as always with the live stream, but I do have to get on with the rest of my life. So um, I will try to announce future live streams ahead of time as best I can. For any of you who dove in in the middle on this one, within a couple hours, the entire video of this live stream should be live. Uh, so as always, thank you guys so much. I absolutely love this time that we have to spend together, and I'm looking forward to the next one already. Uh, but I will certainly do this again very soon. So thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking around and chatting. I enjoyed it. I hope you did as well, and we'll see you again real soon.